بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر Par excellence presents ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله Lessons from the stories of the prophets by Mufti Ismail ibn Musa Mank. Sulaiman alayhi salam, part two. Ilyas alayhi salam, Alyaza alayhi salam, Dhul Kifl alayhi salam, Zakaria alayhi salam, Yahya alayhi salam. Solomon, peace be upon him, part 2. Elijah, peace be upon him. Elisha, peace be upon him. Ezekiel, peace be upon him. Zechariah, peace be upon him. John, peace be upon him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-khalqi ajma'in. نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد. All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless all his wives as well as his family members, his companions. May he bless every single one of us and may he bless our offspring and those to come up to the day of قيامة from them. May Allah keep them steadfast on this deen. And may he grant us every form of goodness. Honored ulama, beloved brothers and sisters. Yesterday we spoke about a great prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophet Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. And we heard the powerful story of the queen of Sheba. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the power that was granted to Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam was so great that it eclipsed everything that this woman had had, although she was a king who was ruling a very big army at the time. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us realize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed, if we have the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is nothing more that we need in our lives. This evening, inshallah, we will go through a little bit more of the same story, inshallah. The first question that arises, many people believe that Sulaiman alayhi salam married Bilqis or the queen of Sheba. That is just one narration that has come to us also from the riwayat, from the Israeliyat, the Hebrew narrations again. And other narrations make mention that she married a different man altogether from amongst the people of Sulaiman. And some narrations even say that the progeny of this queen is in Abyssinia, which is today Ethio the Ethiopian region. We don't know, we cannot la no saddiq wa la no kadhib. We neither believe it nor do we belie it. We hold it and we say it's actually none of our business what exactly happened, and we will not be questioned about it on the day of Qiyamah as to who she married and what exactly happened. What we will be questioned about is our own lives and what we did when it comes to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we spent our lives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about another gift of, of Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam. He was so powerful, we had made mention that he had the power to subject all the jinn kind of the time and he did it. And he used them in many different ways, some of them to build. And to build what? All sorts of items, to build buildings, to make huge cauldrons and pots and to do so many other things to build places of worship. And Sulaiman alayhi salam, when he stood with his stick, they were frightened. They were scared of him. What did he do? He gathered all the books of magic, all the books of magic, because magic was very rife at the time. People were engaging in the worship of the devil. People were worshiping the jinn kind. Sulaiman alayhi salam got hold of the jinn kind, subjected them to his command, gathered all the books of magic, and where was the safest place to put all these books? Under his throne. So he placed them under his throne. He would be seated. Nobody touched these books and the magic stopped. Magic stopped. Now when that happened, there was a problem. Because they saw Sulaiman alayhi salam instruct the wind as we mentioned yesterday. 
it would move so fast a month's journey covered in a morning another month's journey covered in the afternoon solely because the wind begins to blow it lifts you off and it takes you away not like the tornadoes of today may Allah protect us where they cause damage this would actually take you very safely by the instruction of Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam so they began to accuse him of magic and they started saying no this man he took all these books he's taken everything he's got control of the jinn and he is the magician he is the big magician and he is now displaying all his authority and his power imagine he got the palace of Bilqis within a split second to be shifted from Sheba all the way to where he was intact and he renovated it within split seconds and he built another palace next to it within split seconds amazing so when they started blaming him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies his name in the Quran Sulaiman did not disbelieve what does Allah mean did not disbelieve anyone who engages in magic or who seeks magical meaning something magical from someone they have lost their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and entered into the fold of kufr. They've entered into the fold of disbelief. So Allah is saying Sulaiman did not disbelieve, but the devils disbelieved. The shayateen disbelieved. They were the ones who were teaching people magic. And now there was a question. Well, what is the difference between a miracle of a Nabi and magic? People didn't know because they only knew now one thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent two angels with a certain idea. What was the idea? You people really want to know what is the difference between magic and the miracle of a Nabi? We will show you. You've seen the miracles out there. Now we will show you what magic is all about on condition that you consider it a test from Allah and you don't engage in it. So Allah says, وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِلَ هَارُوتَ وَمَا رُوتَ وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ They came down with magic, two angels, Harut and Marut, where? In a place called Babil or Babylon. And the, the reason they had to teach a few people what it was all about was so that they could distinguish between the miracle of a Nabi and the magic of magicians when they were taught they knew very well that this is magic and what Sulaiman alayhi salam has come with is the miracle of a Nabi just like before them if you take a look at Musa alayhi salam he was a Nabi he had miracle with him and when the magicians who were masters of magic came when they laid or when they threw their ropes and their sticks they knew immediately upon seeing what Musa alayhi salam came with that what we did is magic and what he did is a miracle they immediately fell prostrate because they were masters at the game and they knew what this man is playing is not this game it is actually a miracle it's not even a game so this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the people many people don't know why did Harut and Marut come down they came down to teach the people something that they wanted to know to be able to distinguish between two matters. Like it is said, عَرَفْتُ الشَّرَّ لِأُوَقِّيهِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفِ الشَّرَّ يَقَعْ فِيهِ A person sometimes gets to know what evil things are all about so that he can protect himself from evil. And if you don't know what evil is all about, you might fall straight into it. So sometimes it's important for us to know what happens for example, the wrong things that are there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us about that which is wrong. And he clarifies it and makes it clear. And sometimes in quite a bit of detail so that we know not to burn our fingers. But if we did not want to learn that which was wrong in order to stay away from it, how would we be able to stay away from it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So when these people came down, sadly, when they taught a few people this magic, Everyone they taught, they told them something. Look, we are teaching it to you as a test. So do not disbelieve by using this to cast magical spells upon people. Don't use it. Haram. If you do that, you will lose your iman. You will enter the fold of kufr and disbelief. 
Now, later on, these people started using this magic. Why? When they became jealous of one another and they seen a married couple very happily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ They started practicing what they were taught. How to differentiate, how to split between a husband and a wife. So the magic, one of the first magical spells that people cast very easily is to split husband and wife. So you find this one turns that in that direction, that one turns in the other direction because of a spell that has been cast. This is why it's important every morning, every evening, we read Ayatul Kursi. We read the last three surahs of the Quran so that we are protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the day. And in the evening, we will read it so that we are protected throughout the night. It's very important that we read this. This is the solution. And these are the antibiotics against the bacteria known as the devil and the spells that he casts. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are indeed learning that which does not help them in any way. In fact, it harms them and they are teaching it and learning it. Subhanallah. So we need to know anyone who is learning magic is doing something that is going to harm them. It's not beneficial. Anyone who is practicing it or teaching it to others, it's harmful. It is not beneficial. Allah says, they will not be able to harm anybody except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you read your mu'awidhat, mu'awidhat meaning the verses of protection, there's another verse, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told to say the following prayer and we too should be uttering the same words. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my Rabb, my maker, protect me. I seek your protection from the whispers of the devil and I seek your protection from them even coming close to me. This is also a dua we should be reading every morning, every evening, several times during the day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the devil. Then Allah says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنِ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقُ They knew that what they are purchasing, the deal that they are making, will render them in such a condition in the Akhirah that they won't have any portion left for them in the Akhirah. So in the life after death, there is nothing remaining for the person who wants to engage in magic and cast spells and go and visit witches. And for those who are the witches and the Sangomas and the Gangas or whatever you'd like to call them of today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. How is it done? A person needs to appease the devils. If you take a look at Babylon up to this day, it is the headquarters of magic. There are people, whether they belong to the Illuminati or whether they belong to the Freemasons, part of the same thing, who worship the devil completely. And the devil tells them, we will give you two things, power and kingdom together with everlasting life. And this is the same promise that Iblis made to Adam, our forefather, meaning the first human being. The same promise when he told him eat from the forbidden fruit, he said two things. What is it? Should I show you the tree that if you eat from its fruit, you will live forever, which means you will be illuminated as they call themselves now the Illuminati. Allah protect us. And not only that, you will have authority and kingdom and you will have so much control and you will have the power and all the ownership. And that's what people want to this day. If someone told you, look, I can make you rich in five minutes. May Allah make us from those who don't turn towards them. There's no quick money. There's no quick money. If it comes quick, it goes quick. And if it comes quick in a wrong manner, it will go with a lot of regret. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. May He make us from those who earn halal sustenance. So this is what shaitan began to teach the people. And this is why I said the seat of magic is in one of two places. You find it in Egypt where the pyramids are because there was a lot of magic at the time of Pharaoh and he depended on the magicians and he himself considered himself a god. So they worship him and so you have the annual festivals at the pyramids to this day where all the pop stars and everyone who worships the devil go there once per year and they continue. And believe me, there are so many people who are engaged in this devil worshipping because it makes them feel strong, feel powerful. And the day Allah's punishment comes, shaitan runs away. That's in the Quran. 
when sh shaitan runs away the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment comes. The second seat of magic is Babylon. To this day, there are people who visit. There are people who sacrifice. What shaitan does, he asks a person to do something very dirty. Bring me the eye of an eight-year-old young girl, which is green and slightly maybe blue. So now this man goes and commit murder. When he commits murder, he feels the strength and he really feels powerful. And shaitan will give him some information, not of the unseen, but some information of the past. Because you know, we learned at the beginning of this month about the Qareen. When we spoke about shaitan at the time of Sheet alayhi salam, and we spoke about how he invented all the devils, meaning he invented all the evil ways and how he chose the paths to distract man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches this to us. So for a shaitan or a jinn to tell us what happened in the past is not difficult, but they will tell you one truth and 99 false. So they blame the people of your family for having done magic on you, yet they themselves are pinching a nerve. So what will happen is the jinn knows in your body exactly which nerve is pinched. He will go in, he knows, he will find out. When he comes out, he says, okay, you need to bring me the liver of a 10 year old boy. So now you find people starting to mutilate, kill, murder, take an organ. They call it ritual murder. And when they go and sacrifice, they feel better. They walk up, the nerve is unpinched. Why? Shaitan did it for them. He unpinched it. But medicine couldn't do that. This is why we said, if a person wants to worship the devil, he will see results. Definitely. Even in Christianity and Judaism, there are no immediate miracles. You need to pray to God. If anyone comes to you with a miracle where they put their hand on your head, you hear them uttering mumbo jumbo. They call it dialects, languages. They utter the words worshiping the devil. They utter words that they themselves don't understand sometimes. And the problem is solved. You find a person opening their eyes after they were blind of 20 years. And people say, Hallelujah, Astaghfirullah. Not knowing it's the worshipping of the devil. The devil himself, he will solve your problem. But you won't get very far. Because when you get to your Lord, he will tell you, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعْدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ on that day, shaitan will say, look, I promised you something which was false. And Allah promised you a true promise, but you decided to come towards me. Shaitan says, I had no authority over you. I just called you towards something that was a little bit desirous to your lusts and to what you wanted inside and you suddenly ran towards me leaving your creator on one side and shaitan says today shaitan is saying on this day i am free from you in fact i fear the lord of the world but i just wanted to prove a point to you Look at shaitan. So let us never fall prey. If a person is ill and sick, the correct Islamic way, those who believe in God, keep praying and never lose hope. Continue praying. Let us take a look at Sulaiman alayhi salam. We will see in a few moments, inshallah. So this is the issue of magic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنِ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقُ وَلَبِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْا بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ What an evil way of selling themselves. They sold themselves to the devil. As I said a few days ago, there are people, whether they belong to the Freemason group or any other group, who believe we can come up one day with technology or with some form of knowledge that will result in man being given life to once again. So man then says, until my money is depleted, keep me frozen in X, Y and Z mortuary. And they are frozen on the globe right now for many years, thinking that one day a time will come when people will be resurrecting or people will be re giving life again to dead bodies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. It beats us really sometimes when you sit and ponder over how weak man is. Even if they have another life, then what will happen? They're still going to come to an end. And that's not going to happen. But for argument's sake, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So shaitan says, I'd like you to do for me a devilish deed. People urinate on revelation. People then use the words of revelation to cleanse themselves after. Astaghfirullah, using the toilet. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. Thereafter, they get this power. 
and their face changes. All of them who worship the devil, their faces begin to become extremely sharp featured, very scary with a double eyed look in their eyes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that those are the devil worshippers and there are signs that you will see in them when they speak no spirituality in the face nothing at all people who are behind wealth and behind authority and that is the only thing they have no sense of justice they don't want any justice they only want to serve their own cause our interests if it is in our interests we will do something if it is not we will let them die may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us so this is the devil and these are those who follow the devil and this is why King Solomon's minds are spoken about. And this is why the temple of Solomon is spoken about. May Allah's peace be upon Sulaiman. His intention was brilliant. He in fact abandoned everything, but he had all the books under his throne. They were there. And when Harut and Marut came and taught these people all these items, they warned them, if you engage in this, you will lose your faith in the, in the Lord of the worlds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Very important point to be made mention of Sulaiman alayhi salam once he was inspecting his horses. How many powerful horses he had, the best of the time. He used to use them in battle. And as he's inspecting them, the historians say there were almost 20,000 horses. And in the afternoon he's walking and suddenly the sun set and he had forgotten the prayer, the afternoon prayer. So Allah makes mention of it in the Quran. Powerful verse. Allah says when he lost the prayer because he was inspecting his horses, so many horses, he immediately realized that, Ya Allah, I have made a mistake here i've given preference to these horses over your remembrance and it's made me forget your remembrance what happened he was then stroking the horses one after the other at the leg and on the neck why was he doing that because he knew firstly he could communicate with the horses secondly he would be able to tell the one that is fit to take part in the battle and the one that is not by the neck and by the legs. And to this day, a healthy horse is looked at by the way it holds its neck and by its legs and how it holds the, the leg and how it stands with the legs together when it is told to do that. These are the trained horses. Allahu Akbar. As though they can understand every movement of yours, as though the trainer can speak to the horse. That is how obedient horses are. The same applies to other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which Allah has granted us, a little bit of understanding of their nature and so on. So thereafter Allah says, We tested Sulaiman. We tested Sulaiman alayhi salam. I mentioned yesterday, the narration of 700 women is all fabricated. We don't want to mention it, it is blasphemous. How Allah tested Sulaiman? By making him sick, he was ill. Now all those who say he was a magician, what happened to the magic? This was a test. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he was as though just a dead body on the throne. On the throne. Yet he was the ruler of so much more than anyone before him, more than anyone after him. Because he had control over not only humankind, but far more than that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thumma anab. He, he, he thereafter he sought forgiveness and he came back to us in the sense that he sought a lot of forgiveness when he was striking when he was stroking the horses he was making istighfar together with that ya allah forgive me forgive me for what for the fact that i had missed this afternoon prayer one wonders exactly what type of prayer was prescribed in their sharia but with us sometimes we are busy let's start from the children with a computer game, it's time for salah comes. No, mom, I'm about to win. That is for children. The example. Let's get to us. Business deal, lucrative. Mashallah. You need to close shop. Time for Jumu'ah. Say no, no, no. Just hang on, a few minutes, and you run for Jumu'ah, and we are late. We're not talking of the afternoon prayer. We're talking of Jumu'ah. There are people who arrive late every Friday. Every Friday they come late. Why? 
May Allah grant us the ability to change. I want to pause for a moment and tell you, every Friday there is a competition. That's a powerful hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever comes in the first hour as though he has sacrificed a camel for the sake of Allah. Whoever comes next in the next hour as though he has sacrificed a slightly smaller animal. And thereafter the one who has sacrificed a smaller animal and so on. And the angels, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْجُمُعَةِ وَقَفَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ عَلَى بَابِ الْمَسْجِدِ يَكْتُبُونَ الْأَوَّلَ فَالْأَوَّلِ فَإِذَا خَرَجَ الْإِمَامِ طَوَوْ صُحُفَهُمْ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الذِّكْرِ The hadith says, when it is a Friday, the malaika are standing at the door, writing the names, who came first, who came second, who came third, who came fourth. Until the imam gets up, when he gets up, they close their books and they come and sit to listen. Can't we come first one Friday? Can't our name be written in the book at least? Some Fridays, Allahu Akbar, or every Friday. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. This is what we also learn. Sulaiman alayhi salam missed one prayer and it affected him. And thereafter Allah tested him and he became sick and ill and he continued praising Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him. Now, a very interesting story at the end. In fact, Sulaiman alayhi salam built a temple. What did he do in Jerusalem? He rebuilt Masjid Al-Aqsa, which was built before him by Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Jacob. And right next to it, he built a temple where he used to worship. And it is reported that the type of building and how long it took is amazing. And the forces that were used to make that temple something impossible for ordinary human beings to achieve. And over time, when the armies used to fight Jerusalem, they used to first attack the temple because it had treasures, it had so much in it. And this is why over the years, the temple, where is it? It is reported that that taboot, the Ark of the Covenant, was also kept there. To this day, there are obviously two narrations. One is, his temple was inside what is known as Masjid Al-Aqsa. And two is, just outside Masjid Al-Aqsa. So somewhere there, definitely. To this day, there are people who are digging right around Masjid Al-Aqsa and underneath it. What is their idea? They want to find this foundation of the temple of Sulaiman. And they are saying, we were looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And in the process, they are destroying the Masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the Haram. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our brethren across the globe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect those who are oppressed. And may He deal with the oppressors. He either guide them to goodness, and if He knows they are not going to be guided, then He take care of them in a way He knows best they deserve. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that. And here there is a very, very interesting point. Sulaiman alayhi salam, there was a very interesting rumor that spread at the time that the jinn, they know the unseen. The jinn know the unseen. And Allah wanted to prove, forget about the unseen. They don't even know what is in front of them at times. How did Allah prove that? Sulaiman alayhi salam used to stand with his stick. They were frightened. When he was there, they worked like clockwork. One day as he was standing with his stick, just like that, the angel of death came. And alhamdulillah, he passed away. His soul was taken and it was gone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was still standing with his stick and his eyes opened. What happened? A day passed, two days passed, a time passed, some, a long time passed. And all the jinn were working very, very hard in front of him, building something that he had wanted. There are different narrations as to what exactly it was, but that's besides the point at the moment. And he is standing. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. When he passed away, Sulaiman, in that position with his stick, nothing led them to know that he died except the little ant that started eating the stick. The stick was wooden. The ant started eating the stick. When the ant began to eat the stick from the bottom, as it came up at a certain point after some time, the stick broke. When the stick broke, Sulaiman alayhi salam, who was balanced on it as a dead man, dropped. So Allah says, 
تبينت الجن أن لو كانوا يعلمون الغيب ما لبثوا في العذاب المهين When he fell down, it was now known to everybody that had the jinn known the unseen, they would not have been punishing themselves by working so tirelessly in front of him. Yet he wasn't even there. Subhanallah. So this was the death of Sulaiman alayhi salam mentioned in the Quran. That when he died, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a great sign for humanity at large and for the jinn kind as well. That look, O oh jinn, never mind, you, you, know the, you don't know the unseen, but worse than that, something right in front of you, the man is dead. You don't even know he's dead. For a long, long time. Imagine the type of fear and awe that they had for Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. Yet he was very, very humble. Yesterday we saw how he spoke to the ant. He spoke to the hoopoe bird. He spoke to all his people. He spoke to the queen of Sheba with utmost respect. Yet he had more than anybody else. You know, we say a click of the finger. No, a blink of the eye. That was Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. And the Quran says that. Now, after that, inshallah, we now move on to some of the other anbiya that are mentioned in the Quran. There are some Ilyas alayhi salam, Ilyas, the Prophet Ilyas, may peace be upon him. The Prophet Ilyasa, some know him as Elisha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace be upon him. And the Prophet Dhul Kifil. These Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mention much detail about only the Prophet Ilyas. Allah says in one place a little bit of detail. So in the other places only a name is mentioned and a word of praise that they were Al-Akhyar. Al-Akhyar meaning they were good people. They were the best of the lot and so on. As we said, whenever we hear a narration that is against the dignity and respect Accorded to a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Allah, we should throw the narration out because Allah says these people were chosen. They were chosen. So if the prophets were bad, the people would have been able to justify their wrongdoings to say, look, you also a sinner. What are you telling us? So this is why we need to be careful of some of these narrations that are seeping in from others. May Allah protect us. Allah says, إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Ilyas was from amongst those who were sent. He was a Nabi. When he told his people, Won't you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What was their crime? أَتَدْعُونَ بَعْلًا وَتَذَرُونَ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ اللَّهَ رَبَّكُمْ وَرَبَّ آبَائِكُمُ الْأَوَّلِينَ How can you worship this idol known as Ba'al? And you're leaving the creator of everything, the most beautiful creator of everything, the best of creators, in the sense that he is the one who makes from nothing. We've explained the difference between when people say, I created this. They did not create anything. They only transformed the creation of Allah from one to another. And they had wood, now they have a chair. They had metal, now they've got a motor vehicle. That's not creation. Creation is when you say, be. And suddenly it's in front of you. This is creation. So, so Elias alayhi salam is telling his people, how can you worship all these items and this main idol that you're worshiping and you're leaving the one who's the maker, the creator, the supreme creator. Allah, who is my creator and yours, my Rabb and yours and the, and the Rabb of your forefathers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they belied him. So what happened to them? They were punished. The punishment was brought forward and they were made present to where the punishment was. They were punished. We don't know more about this prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we move on to a very famous Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom his birth and all the details of his young life are not mentioned in the Quran. Remember we are trying to derive lessons of the stories of the prophets or from the stories of the prophets in the Quran. The prophet Zakaria, he was a prophet and at his time, the one who used to lead the prayers was a man very pious, what we, what we would call today the Imam or the Shaykh. He was a very, very pious man known as Imran. Imran was related to Zakaria. How? They were married to two sisters. So Zakaria alayhi salam and Imran the two of them were related in that way and they had a link and a connection. Both of them did not have children. Both of them, their wives could not bear. And one day the wife of Imran 
she used to pray these were very pious people very very pious people the wife of imran he she she used to pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never losing hope it is reported that one day she saw a bird giving a little bit of food bringing some food and flying in to feed the little chicklet and when the bird put the food into the beak of its little baby and the wind blew it took its wing and it covered its own baby and she felt the desire to have a child at that age she said ya allah grant me a child ya allah we are serving you this is my husband he is leading the people in prayer and so on ya allah bless us with some goodness and she continued praying and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded her call but she had made a promise listen to what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إذ قالت امرأة عمران رب إني نذرت لك ما في بطني محررا فتقبل مني إنك أنت السميع العليم. Remember the time when the wife of Imran had conceived. She then made a pledge to us to say, Ya Allah, I am dedicating the child who is in my womb. For your service completely, the child will not be doing anything else besides your service, serving this house of yours, serving this place of worship, and totally for your service dedicated. And this is what I have promised. You are the one who has heard, and you are all knowing. This is how pious they were. Mashallah. When we have children, we make du'a. Allah keep them pious. Allah make them the coolness of your eyes. Allah make them, inshallah, pious people, the champions of the deen. But the others who don't have belief, as soon as the child is born, they bring a football. They put it here. We are. As soon as the child is born, they have a tennis racket. There you are, or a golf stick. Allah protect us. I hope that's not the same golf stick used to break the windows of the vehicle. May Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us goodness. So it's important for us to learn a lesson. Allah accepted it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard this call and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنْثَا When she gave birth, she said, Oh my Rabb, I have given birth to a female child. Allahu Akbar. Wallahu a'lamu bima wadat and Allah knew best. Allah already knew more than anyone else what she was going to give birth to and the fact that she had given birth to a female child. Walaysa dhakaru kal unsa. Allah is saying, and a female is not like a male. Now that is a verse of the Quran. What does it mean? Let us understand this issue of equality in Islam. In Islam, men and women are totally equal when it comes to their access to their Rabb and their Maker. A man becomes pious, a woman becomes pious. A man achieves rewards, a woman achieves rewards. A man, the sins will be held against him, the same applies to a woman. A man has access to Allah, a woman has access to Allah. Everything there, spiritually, subhanallah, the access to the Creator is equal. But Allah is telling us that physically, we have created you differently. And emotionally we have created you differently and this is why sometimes when people say no islam treats a woman unfairly they don't realize and understand when allah's made something allah has created something in a different way and allah's created certain responsibilities for one that the other cannot have whether they like it or not so when it comes to pregnancy childbearing breastfeeding and so on a man cannot do it whether he likes it or not it's not his job and this is why a woman can achieve closeness to Allah through certain acts of worship that a man cannot. One of them is childbearing. The other is she gives up her whole home and everything when she gets married. Allah has made her such that she can adjust better than a man when it comes to an environment. She is created in that way. And so many other acts of worship she can engage in. If a woman dies whilst bearing a child or whilst giving birth or in the sickness connected to the women's issues Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants her paradise on condition that she was patient can a man engage in those acts of worship the answer is no and Allah says and we've given man some authority as well so in certain ways a woman is higher than a man and in certain ways a man is higher than a woman and in the other ways they are all equal 
what is so difficult about understanding this? Why do we still want to defy it? And this is why I tell people who say, no, 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 we are absolutely equal. I say, look, it depends what you're looking at. And it depends how, in what context you are speaking. Why do we have Mr. and Mrs.? Why do you have the extra S? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. It's a fact. Why do we have really? Why do we have to say this is male and female? Let's just say male for everyone. This is a male and this is another male. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Would, we, would that happen? So common logic tells us we're different. Why then do we want to shove down the throats of the people? No, we are equal in every way. The problem is when we say equality, sometimes you find some males using it to oppress females. This is where they are wrong. And today you find women calling males names and fighting for gender equality in order to rise above the man. So it is reverse. May Allah protect us. So then in a few years time, we'll be fighting for our rights. Remember, male is M-A-L-E. A female has an F-E over and above that. Mr. is M-R. A female has an S after that. So it's much more than we, what we have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So even in letters, they are higher than us. Obviously, that's on a lighter note. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, <laughs> Man is not like a woman. She had said, I would like this child to be dedicated to the monastery or to this uh, place of worship and so on. But now we have a problem. What is the problem? It is a female child. But anyway, <laughs> This mother is saying, the wife of Imran, she is saying, I have given her the name Maryam, Mary. Who was this Mary? The mother of Jesus. May peace be upon him. She was now born. And this is what her mother had said. Subhanallah. Wa inni sammaytuha Maryama wa inni u'idhuha bika wa dhurriyataha minash shaytanir rajeem. I have given her the name Maryam. And Ya Allah, I seek your protection for her and for her progeny, for her offspring to come from shaitan the accursed. So in narration in Sahih Muslim, it is reported that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, when a child is born, shaitan comes and poke the child. He's jealous. So the child cries. So this is the, the interpretation religiously of why the child cries as soon as they're born. Obviously, from a medical aspect, there are other reasons. The lungs inflate and everything else happens and so on. But the child is pricked. There were two, only two, whom that did not happen to. One was Mary and one was Jesus. Maryam, alayhi salam, may peace be upon her. And the other one was Isa, alayhi salam, may peace be upon him. Because the mother had already asked Allah to protect them from shaitan and Allah gave them that particular dua. He said, okay, there you are, protected from shaitan. Now what had happened? There was a problem. As she was born, they took her to this place of worship and they wanted to fulfill the promise. She wanted to fulfill the promise for the child. There was a problem in that whilst she was pregnant, the father passed away. Who was the father? Imran. The sheikh, the great sheikh, he passed away. When he passed away and the child was born an orphan. So Maryam was an orphan. Mary, may peace be upon her. There was a debate who should take care of this child. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمَا كُنْتَ لَدَيْهِمْ إِذْ يُلْقُونَ أَقْلَامَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ يَكْفُلُ مَرْيَمْ You were not there when they had this debate and they drew lots as to who should look after this child Maryam, who should bring her up, under whose care. So the priests and the others, the religious people and the pious, they said, no, we all want. Each one was claiming the right. And Zakaria alayhi salam, who was the Nabi, he said, look, I am her uncle. My wife and her mother are sisters. As an uncle, as a Nabi, it is my right. They said, no, what gives you the right? Let us draw lots. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were not there when they were drawing the lots. But anyway, we've told it to you that this is what they drew lots. What happened? They, drew, they took their pens. And it is reported 
two, three different narrations. But the Quran does say they drew lots with a pen, with pens. Each one took their pen and put their pen and they had a little child come to pick a pen. And the child picked the pen of Zakaria. Alayhi salam. They said, no, we've got to try again. So they took their pens, put it into a little wooden casket or like a pencil case sort of a thing. And they said, we're putting it in the stream. Any one of these pens that flow against the stream, against the flow of the water, that will be the person. So only Zakaria alayhi salam started flowing the other way. The rest were going down. There's a second sign. They said, no, now let's do it for the last time. If these, whoever's flows with the stream will have the child. Now that didn't really make sense because all of them were supposed to flow. So Allah made it such that everyone else's flowed against the stream and this one flew, flowed with it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it was Zakaria who took her and looked after her. Now there was something strange. They had kept her as she was growing up in the room known as a mihrab is a little corner of worship. Every time Zakaria alayhi salam went there, she was engaged always in acts of worship, in remembrance from a very, very young age. And she used to clean and she used to keep the place tidy. And she was a person who was dedicated for the service of this place of worship. Very, very pious woman. Woman of the highest levels. But she was still a young girl. Every time Zakaria alayhi salam went, he would find something amazing. She had food, fruit that was not from the season they were in. So the fruit of summer was found with her in winter as fresh as ever. And the fruit in winter was found with her in summer as fresh as ever. So he says, Anna laki hadha. Where did you get this from? She says, Huwa min I got it from Allah. Inna Allah yarzuqu man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab. Allah gives sustenance to whomsoever he wishes. Without account, Allah doesn't take into account that it is summer and it is winter. If he wants, he can give you anything. Now these were miracles that were happening at the time. So Zakaria alayhi salam saw it. He was the only one who noticed. And he told himself, Subhanallah, I want to draw an example here. This is the Qudra and the power of Allah. This little young girl is telling me Allah can give whatever he wants. I know that I'm a Nabi. But if Allah can give off season fruit, then surely I'm an old man. I don't have any children. I am equivalent to off season. When it comes to children, Allah can give me children. That's exactly what he thought. He says, my wife is barren. She was barren. She could not bear children. But he says, that would be equivalent to being off season. But still Allah can give her a child. So he raised his hands. Allah says, Hunalika da'a Zakariya Rabbah. At that juncture, Zakariya raised his hands and he says, O Allah, grant me a pious offspring. Ya Allah, you are the one who can hear my prayer. You are hearing me. At that juncture. In Surah Maryam, there's a whole surah named after this child Mary. There is no chapter of the Bible named after Mary. May peace be upon her. But the Quran has an entire chapter named after her. Mary, may peace be upon her. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her in every single way. So, this man in Surah Maryam, Allah says, Kaf ya sad Dhikr rahmati rabbika abdahu zakariya Allah starts the surah with powerful letters. Only he knows the meaning of those letters. Then he says, remember the mercy of Allah upon his slave, Zakaria. When he called out to his Rabb, he called out with humbleness, humility, silence. And between him and Allah, he called out. What did he say? Allahu Akbar. Qala Rabbi inni wahana al-azmu minni. Oh my Rabb, my bones are now weak. Washta'ala al-ra'su shayba. And my hair is grey. 
ولم أكن بدعائك رب شقيا but I will never lose hope in you I will continue praying to you my prayer will never be wasted may Allah grant children to those who don't have offspring remember never lose hope look at Zakaria says ya Allah I'm now old one wonders his bones were now weak he says my hair is great I'm not going to lose hope ya Allah subhanallah he says يَرِثُنِي وَيَرِثُ مِنْ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ وَجَعَلْهُ رَبِّ رَضِيًّا Oh Allah, grant me a child who will inherit me and he will be an heir of the family of Jacob. An heir in what? Prophets did not inherit or did not leave behind wealth for someone to inherit. But the inheritance being spoken about is prophethood here and the service to Allah. Ya Allah, I want a male child who can continue my lineage and this goodness and the family of Jacob. He can follow the footsteps of the Prophet Jacob. May peace be upon him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Zakariya, we called out to him, O Zakariya, Inna nubashiruka bi ghulamin ismuhu yahya lam naj'al lahu min we are giving you good news of a child that your wife shall conceive and bear and we have named him Yahya or John in the English language we have given him that name nobody before him has ever had that name Allah says and no one will be similar to him in certain qualities he had some qualities which he was the only one who had those qualities so amazingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about Yahya and Allah named him. Look at this. Allah named him Yahya. The name was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the name John Yahya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the beauty. I still find the word, the term, the Arabic term is far more sweeter than the English term. May Allah grant us a deep understanding. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this man, he was thankful to Allah. But at the same time, he was, he needed a sign. How can I go and tell my wife, okay, you're going to expect. And you know you're expecting and so on. How can I say this? And what will happen? I'm old. He says, Oh Allah, how can I have a child now? Now he is shocked. He's thankful, but at the same time he's shocked. He wants confirmation. Ya Allah, how can I have a child now? Ya Rabbi, how can I have a ghulam, a little baby boy? You've already given the name and everything. Ya Allah, how can I have this boy? When? My wife is barren and I am so old, Ya Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qala kathalik. Allahu Akbar. Allah says, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He told him that didn't we create you before? This is how Allah creates. Allah says, be, and it is. In the Arabic language, we say, Amruhu al kafi wa noon. The instruction of Allah is between a kaf and the noon. Those two letters put together make an instruction. That is called the word of Allah. When Allah gives that word, things happen. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zakaria says, Qala Rabbi ja'alli ayah. Oh Allah, give me a sign. When I see that sign, I will know that now she has conceived. Qala ayatuka alla tukalliman nasa thalathata ayyamin illa ramza wa dhkur rabbaka kathira wa sabbih bil ashiyi wal ibkar. He says, Oh Allah. In fact, Allah says, Oh Zakaria, your sign will be that there will come three days in which you will not be able to speak to people except through signs. Then praise Allah, engage in His remembrance, constantly be thankful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakaria alayhi salam was very, very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then as he went out, فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِنَ الْمِحْرَابِ فَأَوْحَىٰ إِلَيْهِمْ أَنْ سَبِّحُوا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيًّا In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this verse I just read is referring to Yahya alayhi salam later on. But we go back to Zakaria alayhi salam where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very clearly, the day came when he could not speak. 
And he knew this is the sign of Allah. He got up and he's addressing people with signs. Illa Ramzan. He had these signs and he's telling people to obey Allah and so on. And days later, the news was out. Subhanallah, his wife was expecting and she gave birth. Subhanallah. To this messenger, a great messenger known as Yahya alayhi salatu was salam. Now, Yahya alayhi salam was the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who was blessed with so many good qualities. Allah says, فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِنَ الْمِحْرَابِ فَأَوْحَىٰ إِلَيْهِمْ أَنْ سَبِّحُوا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيًّا يَا يَحْيَىٰ خُذِ الْكِتَابَ بِقُوَّةً وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيًّا Allah says, we gave Yahya the book and we told him hold fast to this Torah. The Torah was given, reiterated, repeated to Yahya alayhi salatu was salam. It is reported that he had memorized it, the Torah. And he was sent to Banu Israel. Remember all these messengers were sent to Banu Israel. They are the children of Jacob. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave him wisdom knowledge from a very very young age we gave him knowledge we gave him wisdom we gave him so much goodness and allah says more than that over and above that we gave him something else we made him so sympathetic to the others not only to mankind but even to the other creatures of allah he had such a deep love for not only human beings but all the creatures of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that was from a very young age he was different allah says we granted him that wisdom from a young age he was not like the other children who played and they lied and they joke he was always a serious child he was always interested in learning. He used to read the Torah. He used to learn. He used to sit in prayer. He used to go to the place of worship and pray and so on. And he knew his aunt who was an aunt of his. In fact, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a good memory. Maryam alayha salatu was salam was his cousin. Because Yahya was the child of Zakaria and Maryam was the daughter of the sister of the wife of Zakaria alayhima as-salam so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this young man grew up imagine in the environment of goodness with pure people around him and so on and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says we gave him Hanan we gave him the sympathy and the love of the people and the rest of the creatures and we also purified him in every way and at the same time we made him righteous and Allah says we made him dutiful to his parents and he was not disobedient in any way nor was he from amongst the arrogant jabbar here is referring to arrogance he was not from amongst the arrogant nor was he from amongst those who was disobedient to his parents he was a beautiful child and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how he was a sayyid he was a person a very very well respected person was he did not marry he did not feel within himself the inclination to marry so he was a person who was dedicated completely to the religion he didn't even marry allah uses the word hasur a person who did not marry and he was a prophet and he was from amongst the righteous look at allah praising the prophet yahya alayhi salatu was salam it is reported that later on when he used to call his people he spoke to them with so much goodness they loved him all of them loved him he used to make them cry they used to sit and listen to him and they used to cry tears used to roll down their eyes when they used to hear to yahya when they used to hear him relate from the torah and they used to hear him reminding them of what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent down now the other hand you have zakaria alayhi salam the father of yahya he died. How he died? There are several narrations. One of the Israeli riwayat make mention of the fact that he was murdered. And he was murdered by the king at the time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. But there is mention of a verse that inshallah we will close with a little bit later on. When inshallah we reach the hour by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Yahya. 
when he speaks about these people, he mentions the names of the prophets Zakaria wa Yahya, and then he speaks, he says, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ They used to make haste towards goodness. Anything good, they used to rush towards it. Any act of worship, something to please Allah, they used to rush towards it. And they used to call out to us, having hope in our mercy and fearing our punishment as well. And they were from amongst the humble, those who were dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the pious. They were always concentrating in acts of worship. And they had fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day, the king of the time, the king of the time, and his name is not mentioned, but he heard that there is this man, and he knew him quite well as well, Yahya, but now he had heard that people love him more than you. You are a king, you are the ruler, people dislike you, but there is one man, people are flocking to him in their thousands, and they love him, they want to listen to him every time, moment of the day and night. Who is he? His name is Yahya. The king became jealous. Who is this man? We need to see what he's doing. So on. But in the interim, something else had happened. Allah decided something else would happen. This king fell in love with his own niece. That means his own brother's daughter. And he wanted to marry her. And Yahya was a messenger who used to get up and lecture regularly. And he used to remind people of what is permissible and what is prohibited without fearing. So he constantly said to people that it is forbidden to do this, it is forbidden to do that. And people used to take heed and they used to listen to him. Because of the way he spoke to them and because they knew that this man loves us so passionately, he really wants to see that we are saved from the fire of Jahannam. So he said in one of his lectures that it is forbidden to marry a niece. And whoever does that, he will be cursed by the Almighty. And it is a great sin, abomination, work of the devil, and so on. And the king got to hear this. He became very, very angry. Why is he lecturing? Why is he speaking on a controversial topic? Why? He knows what is happening here. This is controversy. We don't want it. Imagine, to this day, you have people, when you get up and say something correct, they call it controversial because they don't want to hear what is right. That is a sign of failure. As I always say, it is the clutch of the devil. We'd better release it before we go too far. So Yahya, he hit the nail on the head and he says, why are these people? Or the king is now saying, why is this man saying that you are not allowed to marry your niece when he knows that I want to do this? Now he couldn't do that because had he did that, the people would have reneged against him, probably stood up against him, maybe fought him, there would have been chaos. So he decided, okay, let's hold it for a while. But this niece was also a culprit. She also did not rest. She said, no, I'm not going to stop. The marriage, which was about to happen, and this one man stopping, it can't be. So she began to start sending different types of messages to the king and dancing for him and singing for him at different occasions and so on and luring him until he really felt this desire that I need this woman in my life. So she said, no, you have to marry me. Defy this man. Imagine a woman ruling the whole roost. One woman creating havoc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, she said, no, you get rid of this man. You, you must marry me, number one. Number two is, as mahar, I want the head of Yahya. Look at how dirty, filthy, ugly, bad, wretched, evil this woman is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. These stories are not mentioned in the Quran as fairy tales. They are there for us to apply in our own communities and in our own societies and in our own situations. Wherever they fit, we fit them to learn a lesson. And the idea is to learn a lesson for myself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us steadfastness. What had happened? The king decided, okay, that's it. He sends his army and he told his men, we need the head of this man. Yet the man was loved by everyone. They went into him whilst he was engaged in prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mihrab, in that place of worship. They cut his head off and took it back to the king. The Prophet Yahya, John, may peace be upon him. 
He had met the Prophet Jesus and they had lived, they had discussed, inshallah, we will see that tomorrow. But we are speaking now of how he was brutally murdered. And Allah says in the Quran, and we will end with this verse. those who disbelieve and they go out killing the messengers of Allah and they go out killing those who are instructing them to do good and those who are upholding the justice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let them know that there is a severe punishment awaiting them those are the ones whose deeds have been wasted in this world and in the next and indeed in the life after death they will have nobody to help them at all this is a powerful verse that allah makes mention of in surat ali imran when he's speaking of the family of imran that family was a very small family and a whole chapter in the Quran is named after the family of Imran. It was made up of Imran, his wife, his daughter Mary or Maryam, and her child Jesus or Isa alayhi salam. The Quran has named a whole chapter after the family of Imran, another whole chapter after Mary herself, Maryam, may peace be upon her. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. The lesson is when we get irritated by those who are telling us Allah has said this and Allah has said that and this is the law of Allah and this is what it is supposed to be that is the first sign of rejection from within we need to be careful let us extinguish that fire as it starts don't allow yourself to be irritated when people press the right buttons and when they are speaking about items we are guilty of involving in because that is a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like the Prophet Yahya, when he lectured them, they got upset. And they started saying controversial. And we don't want it. And he shouldn't say this. They ended up killing him. Some of us, may Allah protect us, we would like to extinguish people. We would like to remove people from the face of the earth. When they tell us, brother, you are totally wrong. You are heading in the wrong direction. Be warned of a punishment and so on. We don't like it. Let us change our ways and habits, inshallah. Let us love those who correct us. That is the only way we will improve until we meet tomorrow, inshallah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaha.